Torchwood started out as an offbeat Doctor Who spin-off on BBC3. Craning to be taken seriously, there's cursing within the first few seconds of the series 1 premiere, then the very second episode is about the sex gas alien and so on. That first series was messy, sometimes hilariously so, but it was successful enough that the show got bumped up to the BBC2, where its less chaotic second series wasn't even great at success. A third series in the vein of those first two, 13 episodes, cases and monsters of the week and so on, began to get planned, but again, the show was promoted up, right up to the BBC One. The difference? Less episodes. Being on BBC One is a much trickier affair, it's a competitive channel, lots of shows are battling for airtime, so the idea was raised to just do five episodes, and producer Jane Tranter had the idea to have them all broadcast over the same week, Monday to Friday. Showrunner Russell T Davies grabbed at that, and so what we ended up getting was the one story across five episodes, a story so acclaimed and celebrated that I've known many to have just watched it, or just liked it, and not the rest of Torchwood. The four of us have seen the rest of Torchwood, more or less, but are going to be discussing this third series today, this tale of conspiracies and karma and complicity and children as the future and character conclusions and descent into totalitarianism and all that. So, details of those five ten-year-old episodes now, ten-year-old, yeah, will be detailed by those present. What did we think of the series? Code, you watched it for the first time, the most recently, so what did you think first? It traumatised me. It was... Very, very good. It's probably the strongest of all Torchwood in terms of story, but it's probably the most hard hitting. Um, it, it sort of doesn't pull any punches the entire time because it's only five episodes. You've got so much crammed in. It never feels overstuffed, which is remarkable. Um, and the pacing's very good and everything, but it's just constant trauma after trauma. And I really, really loved it. But some things made me so sad that I wish they hadn't happened. And that's all I have to say, because I'm going to start crying. Tom Ditt, what did you think of Series 3? Well, it was kind of represented everything that I wanted Torchwood to be from the very beginning, which, you know, I I don't dislike the first two series. I just think they're so wildly inconsistent that it's hard for me to properly invest in all of the characters. It's not that I don't like the characters, it's just that, you know, Owen frequently gets on my nerves and, yeah, just tons of things irk me about it. But Series 3 is kind of, as the way it relates to Doctor Who, it's kind of has this self-loathing about uh, science fiction in general. The whole theme of secrecy, which permeated the first two series, is kind of deconstructed in Series 3, which is, like, made explicit through the destruction of the hub in Episode 1. It kind of... The first two series were very indulgent in how it like revels in all the clandestine um, sort of yeah. spy stuff, and series C really just cuts through it and um, focuses on like you know the public and in a way which really spoke to me and yeah uh, I love it. It's like probably one of the best things Russell T Davies has ever done. It's kind of it does the similar thing what Midnight does. It sort of holds a mirror up to humanity, except I think this is much stronger than Midnight even. Mm, mm. So, yeah, that's pretty much my thoughts. When you were saying you dislike Owen, I'm just picturing him passing off a rodent screen cleaner towards you, preening for your affection as you turn him away. <laughs> it's truly sad. But in Giga, what did you think of Children of Earth? Well, bouncing off what Tit said a second ago, and in, in that it sort of deconstructs the whole clandestine thing and things that were treated as maybe good or fascinations in the early Torchwood, it struck me on the rewatch that I just finished that um, despite it's sort of it's the most acclaimed Torchwood story, and it's seen by many people as uh, the pinnacle of Torchwood, and yet throughout it maybe feels the least openly Torchwoody of the show like the role of Torchwood in it is almost more uh plotty wise like I mean Torchwood they don't manage to achieve a great deal as an organization certainly it's it's about Jack very heavily it's about him and obviously the relationships between the the various characters but Torchwood as a concept is rendered almost redundant and we've got more of this individual story about the workings of uh the workings of government and you know our relationship to our children and a very interesting vision and statement from rtd that's being made so it's always almost a bit like doctor who in the sense and yeah i'm starting it off early with a trite doctor who shit but um in the sense that it's the show is almost the most itself when it's
it's the least itself. Like, it's so divorced from the entire format that we got used to in early Torchwood. It's so completely its own thing. And yet in that process, it ends up becoming maybe the truest version of itself. And I think that's quite interesting. I'm going to, I don't know if you'd characterize this as pushing back, but I'm going to slightly disagree with the sense that I'm, this isn't what you're all necessarily saying, but I think Children of Earth evolves fairly, fairly naturally out of the first two series in that Small Worlds, the fairy episode from series one and Adrift, the screaming for 20 hours a day episode from series two, I think are basically like the two building blocks that RTD drew from to make this because both of those episodes have what, uh, what would you call this? Like a moral quandary that can't be brooked like an unsolvable moral quandary with no doctor-like saviour figure to actually come with a solution. They both have that in them. And then Small Worlds has the whole Jack having to sacrifice a child because this moral quandary can't be solved at all. And the Drift is the, is the episode that really focuses on kind of making these conspiracy narratives with Jack's past and with making Jack himself kind of the mystery and the his past actions birthing present problems. Although in that episode, it didn't really turn out to be a problem in the end. He was doing the best that he could. But it kind of sets up this kind of narrative style, which although the writer Chris Chibnall wasn't involved in Children of Earth, I think it's really mapped onto what that episode did. And even to an extent what Chris Chibnall's Countryside did, which was very much more focused on not the supernatural evils, although the 456 are the actual, you know, otherworldly evil in this, but the more present evil is very much the government and even Jack's past and the humans and all that. So I don't think it's quite as disconnected from the first two series in some senses, but certainly uh, in a lot of aesthetic ways and what it's more tangible concerns are with, I can say that. Yeah. And Gig, I think kind of what you were getting at is that what struck me with rewatching this is you could almost do an edit where you remove Torchwood from this and Frobisher just becomes the main character. Or if mm. some, with some reshuffling of the script, it could be like a mini series just about the civil servants. And I think the Torchwood stuff, it's really impressive how RTD ties Jack and, you know, the rest of the Torchwood characters in. But it is very separate and divorced from the, you know, the political and, you know, the, the government angle. But Torchwood is sort of um, <laughs> not closely entwined with the government, but that whole idea of the leaders of the country, I mean, Torchwood just set up by Queen Victoria and everything. So it's not like Torchwood is a separate thing anyway. Um, they're always tied up with the civil servants in a way, but probably in a way that was never really, well, it wasn't really shown in series one and series two and how their actions might be received on a sort of government level. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting how they tied the two together, sort of two worlds where one is the, um, the sort of hard reality of dealing with this sort of stuff and then it's a like level above the people who are given the orders but are removed from it. They don't actually know how it feels to be dealing with it directly and that's probably why part of the reason anyway why they find it so easy to make such horrible decisions because they don't get to see the reality of it they are yeah. sitting they're sitting in their uh boardroom and they don't get to see the screaming mothers who are losing their children but that's the sort of thing tortured sees on a daily basis um when they're dealing with aliens and just all these sorts of things so I think it was a sort of interesting contrast between the two because in a way you're getting the sort of uh, human side of dealing with the sort of supernatural alien elements in the form of Torchwood and then you're also getting the sort of faceless evil side from the government who who just don't understand. I, yeah, I think in that way it's like the first two series were much more... We've spoken before like a big theme of Torchwood is like the friction between these two worlds, the mundane, very human, very Cardiff, you know, velocity of a kebab world, and then the mystical other spaces, supernatural world, you know, rubbing up against each other. And then Children of Earth is more kind of, it's kind of flipped the other way around where it's more the human and the mundane world is rubbing up against the 456, which are very much, I think, the lesser part of the series. Not that they're worse, but that they're just kind of an object there to characterise the main stories, which is much more about the government and about John Frobisher. And on that note of John Frobisher more as the protagonist of the series, I'd agree. I think he might even have the most uh, solid character arc of everyone as he rises up in power and then his sins kind of come back to haunt him and he's undone by those sins. Into I love this idea that he orders the blank page or white page or whatever it's called to 
exterminate Torchwood. And I love when he does it. He passes the page to these that woman, like his uh, work partner, Bridget Spears, I think she's called. And he can't even meet her eyes. Like, he's kind of looking furtively away. And then he, like, scurries off. Like, he's, it's such this banal evil, just, you know, part, a, a cog in the system. But anyway, he tries to exterminate the Torchwood family. And it, you know, it fails. And then in the end, he's, he, has, he exterminates his own family. And because I think so much of the series is about failing to pass the buck. Like, it's only in the finale, it's only when Jack finally kills a kid with connection to him that the whole thing is solved. You know, and all the problems before were killing orphans or culling poor children and that. The whole thing's only concluded when the buck can't be passed anymore. And I think he's, he's kind of like a little fractal representation of Jack himself there in that Obviously, their personalities are completely different and their ideologies are completely different, but they're both trying to get off by passing the buck off to someone else. And then in the end, they, they fail at doing that. But Frobisher, certainly, he typifies all that banal evil and, you know, uh, embodying the system that he ends up being spat out by because, you know, it doesn't care about him in the end. So, I, I, can, I can definitely see him as the main character, if that's what you guys were kind of getting at, yeah. It strikes me with that Frobisher thing that actually maybe that's another way in which Children of Earth is more like connected to the early Torchwood than maybe it appears. Because something we said, I think, in the first podcast is that those that early Torchwood mode is kind of about characters who work and have to are trying to kind of balance this consuming, destructive work with any semblance of you know a life that they may lead. So Gwen has Reese and such. And it, with Frobisher, we see him doing that same thing, except he's not fighting. Well, well, he is sort of trying to deal with aliens. But, um, you know, he isn't a member of Torchwood. So he's still he's still in this work life balance thing. He's still got his family who's trying who he can't tell anything to. And so it's that same that same paradox, that same problem, but put in a different environment. So it's sort of like it really is like the the complete flip of the concept of Torchwood. It's like you know, the, the elements were shuffled around, but maybe the, the core dynamic is quite similar, perhaps. Yeah, I like that because I, I the. It's it's funny because it comes like halfway through the finale when Frobisher kills his family and then himself, but it really it feels like the big finale moment in a lot of ways, and I think it really ties up, you know, a lot of ideas of the series in that it's Frobisher's, you know, he's literally called a middleman uh, several times in the series, and he's and he's literally, you know, a civil servant. He's a cockroach of the government, as they say, and he so he's sustaining the system. And the system only cares about sustaining itself, you know, as we see. It's exemplified by different characters, but it's a system unto itself, the government and all that. And so, him to be destroyed by the logic of that system that he spent, you know, decades sustaining, as Bridget Spears said, and that, you know, the people who take over after him and the Prime Minister are just as bad. It's that woman who was the first to say, cull the poor kids and all that. I, I think that works so well in him dying, because he's... It's funny because he's like the hero and the villain of the series, isn't he? He's the villain to the characters we've identified with. He's the villain to Jack and all them. But he gets, you know, a very beat by beat character arc across the whole thing. And we get a lot of scenes with him. And like Gig's saying, he's kind of in that Torchwood series one sense. And we see him with his work-life balance. It's a really interesting way to do a character like that. And of course, Peter Capaldi absolutely nails it. But we've seen him nail all sorts of roles. He's excellent. You know, before I watched Torchwood, I knew only a few things, and one of them was that Peter Capaldi was in an episode, um, an episode, and for some reason I was convinced he was in Cyber Woman. That's, you know, I don't know, <laughs> I, that's I all I have to say. Maybe is the doctor that comes to try and fix her or something. Yeah, I don't know how I got this impression, I just thought, I was convinced that Peter Capaldi was in Cyber Woman, and that's what I was operating on f- for all this time. So I didn't expect him to have such a huge role in Children of Earth. I thought it was a like small sort of cameo part, although you know, well not really cameo because he wasn't, you know, he wasn't in anyone significant in Doctor at the time. Um, but you know, I just thought it was like a, you know, a little filler role or something. But no, he was basically the main character of Children of Earth, which was surprising. But Pleasantly so. Speaking of cameos, originally, my understanding is in the first conception of Series 3, when it was still going to be 13 episodes, they wanted uh, the actors for Marthy and... Marth... Marthy? (laughs) Martha and Mickey off Doctor Who to be in it. Uh, And I hate this idea, because I think, wouldn't they just slot into the Tosh and Owen roles, and then we'd get another series, like, Exit Wounds didn't really happen. Like, I hate this idea that we could just get another Case of the Week series after Exit Wounds, because... 
that just do you know what I mean? How that wouldn't work? It would feel off. Yeah, you sort of needed uh, a complete shake up of the show. Yeah. I think after Exowins, um, we talked about it in the series two podcast how Exowins sort of deconstructed torture in a sense, um, just removing its secrecy, but also removing so two key members of the team. So to just revert back to the status quo wouldn't feel right, you know, um, and you know. Not to compare to Doctor Who, but yes, to compare to Doctor Who. Doctor Who, you know, is very much a status quo show. Torchwood does not. Torchwood is sort of like, it's, it's linear. It's dealing with life, you know, in a sort of a step by step basis. It's not a show you can easily go back on and just go, well, you know, half our team's dead, but let's go back to sort of, you know, fun monster of the week romps. It just, yeah. it doesn't work. The tone changed so substantially with exit wounds. And it wouldn't feel right. It wouldn't feel, you know, uh, like a logical progression. And and having Martha and Mickey would have would have pushed it too much towards that. I also think that Children of Earth was sort of so full already that it it really didn't need more added to it. And having the inclusion of two essentially big names from Doctor Who would be almost too much because. Yeah they come with too much baggage and although I thought it was interesting I was watching I was watching Journey's End Stolen Earth and Journey's End last night and Martha and Mickey actually sort of at the end walk off with Jack they leave with Jack yeah that was when the plan was for um, them to be in series 3 yeah yeah so it's like you can you could see from that obviously that was what they were intending but I just think it was the absolute right decision not to go with that and also when you're looking at sort of Martha occupying the role of Lois Habiba that would have not worked as well for me either because part of her sort of storyline obviously it would have been written differently if Martha was in the role but sort of the significant moment for Lois is you know when she has that she stands up in the sort of what you call it the room with the table and the people. The important government room. <laughs> the important government room. She stands up and she sort of makes a declaration that, yeah, Tor should have been recording everything, etc., etc. I feel like that hit harder, you know, not that it was a like, strongly emotional moment, but it was more like a, sort of like a fist pump moment, you know, it was like a victory when they've not been having that many uh, so far in the series. Um, that sort of victory moment would have felt almost cheapened by having a sort of really strong character because Martha is yeah. so self-assured and having Lois stand up and essentially face her fears and go like this, no, do you know what? I'm terrified right now. This is the most, you know, the scariest thing that's happened to me in my life and this is probably my absolute bravest moment but I'm going to do it because I I need to do it and I need to sort of contribute to this, this effort to save the world from its leaders, you know? So to have her overcome that fear and stand up is so much more powerful than Martha having a sort of gotcha moment where she's she's already confident enough, you know, to do that herself without sort of worry. Like, she she wouldn't have an issue with that, whereas Lois did, and I think that sort of added to it on the whole. Yeah, so, so it's interesting that even when it became this five-episode event idea, Martha and Mickey were still meant to be in it. I agree that I just... Obviously, it would have been written differently, and the story's very grafted around Lois being a character onto her own but Martha yeah too much baggage too strong too when I say strong of a character I don't mean I love this character the act uh I'm gonna abort this point yeah <laughs> but um, I think we get it yeah, the, Mickey, <laughs> the interesting thing with Mickey is that he was only meant to be in episodes four and five very creatively titled day four and day five and when Russell uh Mickey the actor is not the actor's not called Mickey when Noel Clark dipped out because he was doing some movie or something Russell was absolutely stricken by this and he was moping around and he was going to the cinema and watching three movies in a day they were The Dark Knight Wally and Wanted if you're interested to try and get this out of his head because he couldn't deal with it Uh, because Mickey was apparently such an important part of these last two episodes and then he cheerfully emails Ben Cook and says oh I've completely come up with a different way to do it it's it's totally fine without Mickey now and I can't even picture how on earth Mickey would have fit into these last two episodes so Everything turned out for the best in the end. 
Well, you know how evil bun lady ends up helping them in the end. Maybe it was something oh. to do with something, something to do with organizing that whole thing. Maybe he was involved instead of her. I don't know. I really like her turn, though. Her turn is much yeah. more interesting than, than you know Mickey, Ricky, whatever you want to call them, coming into the narrative. But anyway, it all fell through in the end. No Doctor Who characters in Children of Earth, and in fact, there's a big point made about the absence of Doctor Who characters in that excellent framing device the last episode has about. Gwen recording that thing about why does the doctor not come save the holocaust and it's because if it's not aliens and shit and it's just humans doing really fucked up stuff the doctor looks away in shame which is such a such an <sighs> elegant way to make both these series work so much better because before it was just like oh you know it's like why doesn't iron man show up in captain america 2 or whatever and you just hand wave it oh you know because it's the stories and this is how it's got to work because they can't it will break the stories if you had the characters all interacting like this. And that's always kind of how Doctor Who and history had worked. Oh, it's a fixed point in time. He can't, the Doctor can't kill Hitler. That's, you know, preposterous. That would be so weird. He but just puts in my cupboard. Yeah, <laughs> Rory just puts him in the cupboard. But this idea that it's actually an intentional thing and it actually works in story and in character and it's because the Doctor is so disgusted and ashamed of humans doing stuff like try and cull all the poor kids of Britain. That's just... Fabulous writing. It's so Russell T. Davies. Really love it. It is really good, but it makes me mad. <laughs> um, I really love the intro to episode five. I think, it, it, I mean, it, it does, it sort of fill in that gap because, you know, it is a case of any time there is a hero, you do sort of wonder, oh, why weren't they here when this thing was happening? But the problem with the four, five, six and the Doctor not being there is kind of like... I can understand the idea, obviously, he did not get involved in the Holocaust, and obviously, because that was a very human versus human thing. Oh, God. Oh, God. Anyway, um, I can understand that, and obviously, episode five, the intro of it sort of uh, explains that and fills in this gap, the sort of, these questions that, that anyone, maybe if they didn't consciously think them, it sort of like answers a question they didn't know they had. But there is, there's a sort of upper limit because also the doctor's there to to help against alien threats, um, but alien threats can make people do bad things. We know this. It's not even something that Doctor Who has avoided sort of saying or implying. Um, when someone is faced with an impossible decision, they will be forced to do something awful sometimes. Um, so the idea that the Doctor didn't get involved in this case because he was like, he was disgusted with humans for resorting to what they did because of this alien threat is like, this isn't a criticism of the writing. I think the writing is fine and this is only like a sort of deep dive into the implications of it in-universe. The writing was good, but the writing was bad? No, shut up. No, I don't mean, I mean, the, the idea is perfect because it, the Doctor does sort of turn away in shame, right? But you're thinking about the sort of character motivations rather than the whole concept. Does that make sense? Because, like, maybe Gwen's right and the Doctor does turn away for that reason. So, the whole idea of interpreting as the Doctor turns away in shame because he's so disgusted by the human race is good. But from a character standpoint, it's almost, not hypocritical, but it's sort of, um, it's a dick move, in a sense, because this, is, this wasn't humans versus humans, or it was, but it was humans versus humans catalyzed, catalyzed, what's the word, <laughs> by, by an alien threat. And the thing is, the 456 four, offered an impossible situation. We don't actually know, which I think was a sort of good idea, leaving that ambiguity. We don't know if the 456 had the capability to actually wipe out the human race. You know, we never learn that they have that technology. You know, a lot of the 456 is sort of shrouded in mystery and smoke, um, which is Literally. good. You don't even, yeah, you don't even get to see the full creature, which I thought was, you know, it's probably for budget reasons as well. <laughs> the, the 456 is a sort of, uh, mysterious thing. We never know if it actually has capability to destroy Earth or anything. But it doesn't matter because it gives them a situation, give us 10% of your children or we wipe out the entire human race. This is it's an impossible choice, you know, and, and as much as it's horrific what the government decides to do, you can sort of it's one of those things where, like, if you think about it and you're completely, de completely detached, which they were, and that's the point of them, it, it sort of does make sense in a logical way. Like, okay, well, you either give them 
you know, these millions and you save billions, and that's actually a reference to the episode. Stop making Minecraft villager noises, <laughs> honestly. This this is the logic that the well, politicians use, right? Mm, I'm not saying I agree with it, right? But it's an impossible choice, and you can see what steps they made to get to that point. Because, and again, they didn't know if the 456 had the capability to destroy, you know, Earth. We don't know if they did. So, it was it was a choice that they had to make. It wasn't a nice choice, and it wasn't good. Uh, and regardless of what happened, someone, an innocent still died to solve the whole problem. So, like, the idea that the Doctor would sort of turn away in shame when humanity was forced to this sort of ledge is a bit, especially because it's an alien threat that did it, is a bit silly. And I remember someone uh, said, that really annoyed me, someone said, oh, the Doctor could have solved the Children of Earth uh, situation with no casualties, everything would have been fine, he would have saved the day. Maybe by Doctor Who logic, because Doctor Who is very much a show where it's like, oh, okay, there can be sad endings sometimes, but ultimately things do work out, there is a happy ending. So Doctor Who doesn't tend to go these sorts of dark roots. And generally, one thing that's funny about Doctor Who is that when the Doctor is faced with an impossible choice, he has to choose between one, uh, like, number one or number two, and both are equally horrible, um, he usually comes up with a third option all by himself, um, which is which is really interesting, and it sort of speaks to the sort of philosophy the Doctor Who has, where and also the idea behind the the Doctor as a character, where he will always come up with the the idea that sort of causes the least amount of harm, even when he's faced with something that really you would think, oh, there's no way he can get out of this. So that's Doctor Who logic. So the idea that that in Children of Earth that uh, the Doctor could appear and come up with a third option that didn't result in any innocent deaths and all this stuff. That's great, and maybe he could have, but that's operating by the logic of Doctor Who, not the logic of Torchwood. And this is a Torchwood story, and Torchwood does not pull its punches like that. It doesn't try to pretend that there aren't sometimes horrible uh, results of things like this. It doesn't try to pretend that, that there's always a third option, because sometimes there isn't. So... I think it's kind of reductive to think, oh yeah, the Doctor could have solved this problem. Not not going by the sort of attitude of the show he would be in, because he'd also be in torture at that point. And also, it would be like, it would it would make it almost worse that the Doctor didn't get involved and help with the 456, because again, it's an alien threat. This wasn't humans versus humans, like strictly like strictly that with no alien interference. It was aliens. It was aliens pushing humans to do this by giving them an impossible choice. So if the Doctor could have solved this with no, you know, real consequences, why didn't he? So that, like, and I'm not saying like there's, I'm sure there are like sort of character reasons you could come up with but I'm talking from the perspective of someone like Jack for example and I always think it's not a shame but because I worry they wouldn't ever write it in the way I'd like to see it but it's almost a shame that we never see a story featuring Jack confronting the Doctor for his absence during the 456 incident especially considering all that Jack lost during it um, and what Jack was forced to do so from Jack's perspective, it would be absolutely reprehensible that the Doctor did not fix things if he had the capability to. And we don't know if he did. You know, there might have been something, maybe it's a time lock, maybe it was something, you know, completely arbitrary they'd come up with to explain away his absence beyond the shame thing. Because I think the shame thing is not strong enough on its own to justify why the Doctor didn't. Because I think it speaks more to the flaws of the Doctor as a character than it does to sort of uh, the flaws of the human race dealing with this horrible situation and also it's I like to come up with this idea and this is my own personal interpretation of the Doctor here but maybe part of the reason why he didn't get involved is because he knew that it was an impossible situation that could not be solved without some sort of you know horrible solution you know Um, because obviously Jack was forced to kill, kill his grandson. So, maybe, because... This is getting like really deep into not analysing this one line. Uh, um, maybe the Doctor is a sort of... Moffat puts forth the idea... Obviously, this isn't relevant to the RTD era, but sort of looking back on it now. But Moffat puts forth this, this idea that the Doctor is not... is not who he is. It's something he aspires to be. So... 
But how do you sort of maintain that sort of mythological figure? I always say the day happy ending great hero thing. Because if you willingly walk into a situation that is that is like the four or five six, that is so impossible and there is no third option, at least not that I can imagine. Assuming that for example he didn't have his TARDIS or whatever, because that's usually how they write away uh some the obvious solution to a lot of stories. Could it be that he knew that the 456 was this situation where there was no real way to win and he actively chose not to get involved because he knew that if he did, he would have to make the same horrible choice that Jack did and he was too cowardly to do it? Maybe, I don't know. I just think it's interesting that uh, that he wasn't there and I do think it's a great sort of line it's a great sort of justification turning away in shame but then it has the ambiguity of is he ashamed of the human race or is he ashamed of himself for not helping yeah I think um, your earlier point about narrative logic code I think is the key here because um, for the same reason that obviously it wouldn't be right to bring the Doctor Who narrative logic into Torchwood likewise a character in Torchwood cannot accurately articulate Doctor Who's narrative logic. So while I do love that line from Gwen, I think that's a great scene. I think it's a really, really powerful statement from RTD. Nonetheless, I think trying to treat it as a psychologically realistic explanation for the Doctor's actions, I think is going to, you know, just, just throw up all those problems that you're just going into. Yeah. So at the end of the day, tons of these situations where the Doctor didn't show up, like those, those are still cases of where innocent people were being victimised or, you know, injustice was happening. And like, and generally the reading of the Doctor's character in the show is that, you know, he, you know, he, they try to do the right thing. So, you know, it just throws up problems. And I think what, what, the, um, what RTD is really getting at with that speech is not necessarily an accurate assessment of the Doctor by Gwen, but an accurate assessment of what the fundamental difference between the two shows is as stories. Yeah, yeah uh, just a quick point. Um, I agree that it, it's not, and sorry, it's not meant to be actually telling you why the Doctor wasn't really involved because this is, this is also from the perspective of Gwen who doesn't actually know the Doctor all she has heard about the Doctor is from, I mean obviously she's sort of, sort of met him and Journey's End and everything uh, but she's talking from the perspective of someone who knows the Doctor really only through Jack's stories about him, Jack's sort of idealised stories of him so she's hearing about this hero, this impossible figure who just drops out of the sky, saves a day and leaves again, so she doesn't actually understand the Doctor or know anything about him, so she's sort of in a sense guessing and it's more like she's given more commentary on, on the human race and why they sort of should be ashamed of themselves by you know, talking about this mythological great hero figure and it's the idea of you're being so disgusting and so horrific that not even you know not even this great hero would would want to help you because you're that bad right now so that Gwen's obviously not speaking this is like really analyzing line but Gwen's also not speaking from a perspective of actually understanding the doctor or his sort of psychological state or why he would make the decisions he did so but yeah um it is sort of drawn attention to the sort of fundamental difference between doctor and torchwood yeah. The crux of the moral issue, see, I don't buy that what humans had to do in day five was in any way inevitable at all. I don't buy that in the slightest because they didn't, it wasn't that they were giving children 10%, it was that they were giving them 10% of poor children. <sighs> Exceptionalism is the big issue here. It's not, this is, this ties back into 1965 as well. Jack gives them 12 orphans and then the modern government wants to give them poor children the whole thing can only be resolved when Jack gives them someone he actually has ties to, his own grandson, which treats Stephen completely as an object in the narrative, which is whatever. Some people don't like that. But the point is complicity and exceptionalism in that they're not just giving up 10%, like if this was an unsolvable situation and they had to give him 10% to not be invaded, that's one thing. But they specifically gave up. They all said, we're not going to do it alphabetically. We're not going to do it randomly. We're going to justify why the poor children should be culled. They were actually using reasons for why it's a good thing, why these children should be gotten rid of. We will take these children that we've underserved and we will give them to be, you know, inhaled as drugs to the 456. And that's the huge moral flaw in what they're doing. is isn't just that they're following the 456's orders, but that they're, under, they're operating under exceptionalism and specifically giving them children that they've already not treated well. And they flat out, that woman flat out says, you know, Lord knows we've tried already, as if they have. And is passing them along to them. And that's the, the, the big moral flaw, the crux of it to me, is what children they are giving. Not just the mere fact that they are giving them children. That's why I see the Doctor as being, you know, turning away in shame, at least in Gwen's conception. It's not that they're just giving kids, it's what kids they're giving.
Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Like that, that is why he would be ashamed because that is the evil of it. Really, it's, it's, it would be a tragedy. Uh, it would be a tragedy just by itself if it wasn't for the fact that there's also this aspect of it that was just sheer institutional evil by the politicians because obviously, like they're not being. Uh, not being non-discriminate, they're actually specifically choosing the sort of already worst treated members of society, which is, you know, so, so from that perspective, yeah, I can get why the doctor would turn away in shame, but then how does he justify that to the children that are going to be killed? <laughs> so, so it's like, I, I get what you're saying and that is why he would be ashamed. Not that it'd be any surprise to him that he, the humans are capable of that level of depravity and evil because he knows we are as a as a species he knows that but the problem is like you know he can't exactly sit on his high horse and go like that well i'm not helping you because you're all (laughs) horrific people (laughs) when those those children are being marched to their death you know try explaining that to the ones who are are the victims here can can you not see david Tennant gloating and gurning over these buses of children (laughs) going well you really shouldn't have given this once i was this close to helping you out you shouldn't have voted them in. So yeah, what are you exactly, expecting? Exactly. <laughs> no, so, so yeah, I completely get your point. I completely yeah, get yeah. where you're coming from because because that is you know that is the evil of it. But but I just struggle to sort of fully get on board with that. Oh, one. the yeah. fact is, there are there are innocent victims here, and and again, if the doctor could have solved this problem without any casualties, then he's doesn't matter that he'd be helping the evil government. It's more important that he'd be saving the innocent children. Before getting into any further with that, I think. Even I think even if even if the um the children selection is completely randomised, I think that's that would still probably lead to uh, some of what you see in day five, which is basically the descent into authoritarianism and this sort of this sort of all out war between kind of the state and the people whose children they're trying to collect. And in the story, I think the only the only other alternative that is kind of offered or suggested is fighting back against the four five six, which might of course lead to you know, the wipeout of humanity. But nonetheless, that seemed to almost be looked at as a morally preferable option to actually conceding. Do, yeah. do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. That, well, that's I was about to dove, dove dovetail. It's, that's a word, right? Yeah. I was, about to, <laughs> yeah, I was about to dovetail into that, but prelude before i do i just noticed what we were all doing is what i was just uh kind of criticizing the show for doing slightly and that we, we we treat the children purely as like objects in the narrative here we're like talking about them very removed the same way i think the issue with treating Stephen's sacrifice as like the thematic thematic geez i screwed that up the thematic conclusion of the series is that like he's, he's got his own agency like he's not like an automaton he's not a baby like I would have liked kind of if Stephen was asked if he wants to do this. Even if he said no, I think that would have been interesting. Like, we're talking about the busloads of kids here. Like, I mean, they're, they're still living people. But anyway, but, but what I was going to um, meld into of what Gig was saying is the interesting thing with how... And actually, this ties back into what Code was saying. The interesting thing with the ending of episode four is that it's very much Jack trying to position himself as the Doctor and that I'm going to do a big speech against aliens. I'm going to talk about children as the future. I'm going to talk about the triumph of the human spirit. People will do anything to protect children. I'm going to, you know, do this huge inspirational speech. I name you the boneless, whatever. He does it and it completely and utterly fails. You know, and earlier in the episode, that comes off Lois Habiba doing a very similar thing, which completely and utterly fails, as spirited and as heartening as it is. And then even in episode five, with that civil defense Kik was talking about, like where Johnny Yanto's brother-in-law and Andy fight against the army and Lois Habiba... And the episode beforehand was rising against the government, you know, Lois Abiba's rise up. They still all lose. <laughs> N- none of that actually works, which is what I find so interesting and so Russell T. Davis about this. I totally stand what they're doing so hard. I love it. My heart beats so fast in those sequences <laughs> where Johnny is, you know, fighting the army and uh, PC Andy's taking off his jacket. I love it so much, but it's really notable. None of it really does anything. They don't really save any kids. The army was still about to get the kids Gwen had anyway. What saves it in the end of the day is I think this much, it's less grounded in how reality actually works and it's much more to me like a cosmic, karmic kind of thing. What saves the day at the end is, I've said this like 10 times now, but the buck not being passed, this except there's exceptionalism not happening, Jack having to sacrifice his own child, well, not his own child, his own grandchild. The idea that you, the system can't constantly pass off the consequences and the dregs off to other people. It constantly, it can't just cull off the poor kids. It can't just keep pushing its own problems away. At the end, it has to come full circle. That's the only thing that really saves it in the end. And of course, that's so horrible. 
it's Jack didn't succeed when he was trying to be like the good parts of the doctor when he was trying to be you know a very humanist alien protecting people by talking about how good humans are he succeeded when he went all the way doctor and he became an alien you know the type of person that would leave their grandchild the type of person that would leave the planet whose morality would become so indistinct from humanity that he just couldn't be on the planet anymore so it's interesting those two kind of conceptions of the doctor you know the kind of 10th doctor style moralizing one didn't work but the more maybe first doctor or even 12th doctor style very alien morality one did work in the end i really adore the point you made there about how the sort of speeches didn't work because it sounds it's almost like it's almost like torture to sort of criticize in doctor who almost um or not really criticizing it but it's 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 more like highlighting the idea that doctor who is at its core a bit of a fairy tale story you know it's a bit unrealistic to to an extent because doctor who sucks it's unrealistic <laughs> fuck doctor who sorry <laughs> no um it, it, Doctor Who works as it is. Doctor Who is, is, is very much a sort of story about hope. Um, as the 13th Doctor has told us. Very much a story about hope. Pillar of hope. Pillar of hope. Um, so, Doctor Who is meant to be a sort of fairy tale story. It's supposed to be that way. A sort of blend of fantasy and sci-fi and all this stuff. And you've got the sort of mythological hero um, and stuff. Great, love it. I love Doctor Who and I love what it what it is on its own. But Torchwood is like, as we have said before, Torchwood plays this th- this idea of sort of the realities of life um, rubbing up against the sort of fantasy of this greater universe thread. So Torchwood, in, in a way, is 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 like drawn attention to how how sort of Doctor Who's approach doesn't might not always work in reality. In fact, it, it it's a sort of it's like a framework for sort of mor- uh, your morals in a sense where uh, you're going to do the right thing and ideally you shouldn't fight and if you can avoid it, if you can solve the problems peacefully and, and everyone's happy and everything's good. But torture is sort of like the reality of, all right, so it's one thing if you want to solve it peacefully or not that it was not that the F four five six thing was peacefully, <laughs> mind you, it was a war speech. Uh, but it's one thing if you want to solve it by talking. But sometimes, sometimes direct action is needed because you're talking about these these are characters who are working against a corrupt government. In a sense, it feels like a revolution story. Um, so I just think it's fascinating that the position it's ta- it takes in the end is essentially that the, the words don't really mean much it's action you take the matters not yeah. that obviously the characters fighting back aside from the thing with jack at the end not that it really makes much of a difference but it but it feels more powerful and impactful than those the sort of speech scenes and the idea that jack immediately sort of gets punished almost as much as the shame to sort of frame a character death is is a sort of punishment in a way because again it takes away like agency but then Yanto had no agency in that situation I suppose so (laughs) he kind of got forced to die Um, he was still part of the tortured agency yeah shut up I'm gonna kill you (laughs) um so yeah I I don't know I just think it's it's fascinating that that, that it frames it in that way and also oh because this is a perfect place to bring it in Andy taking off his police uniform (laughs) and charging into battle what is, it, is it scene. just the actor taking off his clothes is the thing we're liking oh, here? Yeah. Or? When he gets naked, it's... <laughs> love it. Mwah. Um, no, but that's such a, such a good scene. It's such a sort of small moment, almost. Like, it's not it's not one of the big big uh, scenes that anyone really talks about, but just the idea that Andy has that sort of moral dilemma and then he sort of falls on the side of, you know, essentially rejecting authority in that situation yeah. because he's realised at that moment the authority and the thing he works for in a sense is a bit inherently corrupt you know so so that's like it's not just it's not just the fact that he goes in and fights and it's a big moment for the character in general a sort of overcoming fears and all that stuff but it's the fact that he takes off the police uniform before he goes in to do it oh it's it's yeah. so there's so there's so many sort of political themes and children are very there's there's themes. two things I want I want to <laughs> themes there's two themes. things I want to split off there 
uh, to Ngiga and Tomtit separately, of course. Uh, the first, I'm going to fold back right before the police jacket thing for one point. And just talking about episodes four ending as like a failure of an ending, did that speak to you, Tomtit, as a fan of Jekyll? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, look, honestly, it didn't hit as hard for me as it would for, you know, a diehard fan of Yanto. Me. <laughs> I love Yanto. I do have a... <laughs> connection to an earlier Moffat show. There's a coupling reference in episode one. When Jack and Yanto are discussing being a couple, which I love that whole character thread, by the way. I think it's very um, true to life, you know, very realistic. Jack's leaving and Yanto's like, where are you going? And Jack's like, oh, now now you're like acting like a couple now, asking me where I'm going and everything. That's those words, where are you going? That's the entire series two finale of coupling hinges around that phrase and like what it means for a, a, a couple. And, you know, RTD has obviously seen coupling, so I think it's Definitely deliberate, but yeah, it, that tickled me. No, that's really oh, that's cool. cool. You should always draw like from that. writers better than yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gig, the thing I was going to ask you is with the whole Andy taking his police uniform off, I specifically didn't take any notes on that because I just wanted you to explain and unpack that for me. So can you do that? Oh, oh, um, that is that is a very interesting um, scene. And I think it beautifully sums up the, almost in, in a way, one of those core themes of torture again, sort of work and life and responsibility. But in this case... Um, it links into the broader political um, themes of Children of Earth, I think. And this this conflict between um, uh, sort of uh, the idea of realising that, you know, the authority you work for is corrupt and having to sort of negotiate that, I think, feeds into this broader thing of the the world systems and the things that the, char- the, our, the heroic characters are fighting against in this case is so, you know, broken. And, you know, we, we were mentioning earlier that the characters who try to fight back ultimately fail. And, you know, the reason for that, I mean, the reason that like, Gwen can't protect the kids is that she's fighting something that is so, you know, un- it's impossible to win, right? Or the deck is so stacked. We have this surveillance state, this huge militarized state. You know, we have this, you know, this, you know, this obviously the police force and the military and the government all working together to do these incredible, horrible, authoritarian things to the populace and all of that. And, of course the deeply unequal system where the politicians can exempt their own children from the lottery and, and all that stuff and the whole thing is like a huge condemnation of um what the, the state of the world and of society in general and i think that even extends as far as the 456 actually because when we find out that they're just trading in drugs and they're doing like a, a protection racket thing the statement there is kind of like wouldn't we as a species be utterly fucked if someone came to earth and did to us the sort of things we do to each other Right, if, if our system was extended, you know, to, to on levels bigger than ourselves, so it's like, so the whole thing is like just really angry and quite savage, furious political condemnation of pretty much the whole. I mean, I don't want to say like the big C word, but like pretty much the whole of the current human project and the state of it, which I think links to the whole the whole bleakness, the and the descent into you know chaos that day five sort of represents. And also, I don't want to bring up years and years just yet, but. They're there is certainly a link there. Thank you much, Lee. I think like the words we are coming, it's sort of as much as it is the 456, it's not really the 456. It sort of refers to like the government coming in on specifically the Torchwood team. But like Yanto, he's on the run from the government and he sees the, those words in the in the newspaper. And you think like that's sort of referring to, you know, his his country or the entire world even. And it also sort of ties into his paranoia with, you know, being you know publicly in a relationship with jack as well so there's this sort of whole systemic like fear which i think really strengthens yanto's character arc in this one we are coming out of the closet (laughs) that's fantastic yanto's character arc there um it's sort of implied um but yanto has a sort of big issue as well sort of coming to terms with his sexuality which i think is, is 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 more it feels very real, I guess, for, you know, he has a lot of fear. He comes from a background, a working class background, which, just to clarify, I'm from working class background, so I can say this, okay? It's not traditionally seen as very progressive. Um, and and certainly when you hear things about his father, like, uh, first of all, we know that he lied about his dad, about who his dad was and what his dad was worked as and everything then there is the lines about for example um whatchamacallit shit i forgot now oh yeah uh, where he writes to his sister saying like where dad broke my leg and everything and then rhiannon his sister says um 
you know, he didn't mean to break his leg and Yanta says he always pushed me too hard. All this stuff. Basically, I think a lot of... And also, um, when... Um, when what's his face? Who, is it Clement McDonald? The old The guy? old Timothy White. Yeah, that's his name, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he said... He, refers to Yanto with a homophobic slur and Yanto reacts quite, you know, very upset. Not only that, but he's he seems to have this struggle with sort of he he wants to sort of be happy and be open about being a, a couple with Jack, but there is this tension, like he's scared to admit it and everything. And then obviously with his uh brother in law, would it be? Yeah, brother in law coming in and, you know, uh being homophobic basically to him it's like uh, um, I get the implication that that Yanto has had to sort of uh, grow up in a sort of um, environment where it was not happy or good for you know basically whether we don't know whether like he was he sort of figured he might have been bisexual earlier on in life and certainly he's not willing to admit it RTD has said and the approach that the show takes is like, oh, um, you know, it's, it's not other men, it's just Jack and everything. And it's not about, it's not about sort of, it's about who you fall in love with, not really what they are in a sense. And that's, that's a great take. And I, and I like that. But, but we are living a sort of society. <laughs> we do live in a society. We live in a society. Um, <laughs> we live in a society. And it's a society that sort of requires you to label, um, yourselves. And certainly I've seen a lot of people like wishing that it was more acknowledged in the show that Jan Toys isn't a bisexual man because it's not that often you get that sort of portrayal. Um, and certainly like not that, some people might argue books don't count, but I've certainly been reading some of the books and there is like there is a point in one of them where Yanto is referred to specifically as that and he reacts quite aggressively in in an upset sort of manner. So I just I just feel like Yanto's backstory and sort of um has arc in a sense. But I think there's certainly something touched upon there. You get a sort of a glimpse into Yanto's backstory. I, I feel like he he doesn't feel safe being himself um and and it's a shame that his sort of life was cut so short because i he was like on the path to finally accepting himself and being open about himself um and certainly i think he probably has some traumas there from his father and oh, but also um there's a communication thing with jack and yanto where there is and it's like hypocritical of yanto in a way uh because yanto says to Jack, I tell you everything, but we know that's not true because we have the whole my father was a master tailor sort of thing. Turns out he worked in Debenhams, and that's something he told Jack that his dad was a master tailor. Um, so he he criticizes Jack for hiding things, whereas um, and Jack starts to open up in Children of Earth, and again it's another tragedy that it was cut so short for them because this was the beginnings of them fully. Like being fully open with each other but at that point obviously Yanto hadn't admitted the sort of truth about his background in a sense um, and maybe opened up about his traumas related to his father because I feel like it's strongly implied there was some there um, so I just think it's interesting like that, that you have this whole idea that Yanto criticising Jack when in reality he's not truthful himself yeah. and that's dealt with in Children of Earth. Yeah, the hints towards Yanto's backstory I think really deepens the whole themes of um, like how easily the family unit that we're sold in most, you know, mainstream media is dissolved. And even RTD shills this constantly in his Doctor Who, like the romantic idea of family, like, you know, the Tylers, the Nobles, all that sort of thing. And I think that's really the significance of, like, why the Doctor is sort of could not appear in Children of Earth because I think it's, like, Tennant specifically, his greatest fear would be, like, that romantic idea of humanity and um, the family unit does not actually work or is not sustainable and would collapse yeah. in, in this scenario. It's so interesting. RTD says his the most romantic form of love to him is unrequited love. So his whole idea of romanticism is very tied up in tragedy and things not working and not not operating right. Like, that's the beautiful thing to him, uh, which is really clear, I think, in his shows. Yeah. Like you were saying before, Code, about, you know, what the Doctor does when he's faced with an impossible choice. I think what Russell does when he gives the Doctor an impossible choice is he has, like, the companion step in, like, you know, Rose Tyler as Bad Wolf comes yeah. in and saves the day. And she is literally that, like, representation of, you know, the romantic, you know, working class human. But, you know, in Children of Earth, you know, the human race is the enemy you know, the Prime Minister in this story and how he does that to John Frobisher 
offloading the burden of you know action to a companion in terms of the doctor if you want to take the tenant hate to its absolute extreme which i do you could say that um the tenant analog is the prime minister in this story almost in that sense well there's probably something there you could dig into even more like the whole and his whole sort of approach to things where he's like he's sort of like on his high horse just like tenant was but yeah that is like it's that's why I think, like, the whole idea that, oh, to talk about Torchwood on its own and everything, just, just put Doctor Who aside, I think it's, like, it's good and it works, but because Torchwood is, in many ways, again, intentionally or not, as a commentary on Doctor Who, as a response to Doctor Who, almost, and the two things, being as they exist in the same universe and they do cross over sometimes, I think it's, like, impossible to talk about Torchwood without considering it from a Doctor Who lens as well, because obviously it was being worked on at the same time, and they do sort of influence each other. They have a very sort of similar... They play with similar concepts, they just deal with them different ways. So I think it's, it is good and it's probably the right thing to do to talk about Doctor Who and Torchwood as a sort of cohesive unit. And obviously, you know... I um, I think that comparison of um, the Prime Minister to the Doctor, I think, re-emphasises the way in which Frobisher is sort of, well, maybe not the main character but the, the the jack analog or the torchwood sort of protagonist analog because obviously jack is a the companion of the doctor at one point the erstwhile companion to whom the responsibility has been offloaded of, of dealing with this whole mess just in just in the sense that the pm offloads the responsibility onto frobisher so interest, that's an interesting mirror between uh, jack and frobisher there as well there's a part of the writer's tale which is uh, the showrunner russell t davies book covering the latter years he was running Torchwood and Doctor Who and that, where RTD is saying, I read an interview with Alan Moore recently in which he said, and I'm not going to read this whole thing out, don't worry, but in which he said, I'm paraphrasing, when you're young, you plan everything. As you get more experienced, you fly on instinct. And Russell, for a while, you know, justifies this as, this is why my way of writing is good. It's okay to, you know, not plan things so much. Yada, yada, yada. He goes on with that. And about how a writer, or at least a writer like him, instinctually will maybe subconsciously set things up to be connected or maybe are just very good at making things connect retroactively or whatever. But what he's specifically talking about is the, uh, what do you call it, like a nursery? Um, Yanto's sister and brother-in-law, you know how they're running that like daycare service? Crash. Ten, yeah, that thing. 10 quid a kid? That's right, 10 quid a kid. <laughs> well, that came when they were doing, when they were breaking episode three, that's, you know, what they created for it. And RTD is saying, I put that in there for no good reason. I just thought about it. I thought it was a bit lively and domestic. And then later when he's confronted with episode five and he can't crack, it comes to him, oh my God, this thing is how I can spell out the whole Children of Earth theme. That's And this is where he like comes up with the idea for naming this series that as well. It's like a bolt of lightning. This is what Davies said. The thought that went, oh, in my head. This has become spectacular and vital and epic and potentially brilliant. It's like I intentionally seeded that back in episode three. I hadn't. I was just having fun. <laughs> but something in my head must have worked at it until it was staring me in the face. And then he says, that's why writing Torture was so painful because how I work now was so much on instinct and cracking the story in a writer's room across three writers demanding that it got planned in detail in advance was so difficult for him because that's not how Russell works. Russell works by at the last minute you know, something being connected coincidentally and then having somehow this super thematically coherent series, you know, born out of that. Very much helped by everyone after the scripts, you know, emphasising that. Like, it was the same director, Euros Lin, for all the episodes who did a great job and everything. But it's fascinating. That's sort of how writing works all the time. Like, well, it's the same thing with, like, analysing literature and everything, media in general. Sometimes there will be things that, uh, you know, people put in their stories or in the movies, TV shows, that they just do an instinct. Well, this just feels right. But in the wider const context of the story um, or the visual medium, it has so much more meaning. And that's also where the sort of um, death of the author concept comes in. Like, it doesn't really matter what the author intended. It matters what you take from it and how you, you know, put, put their the intentions to the side, put their sort of baggage to the side almost take the media on its own thing and look at it then and what do you get from it and I quite like the death of the author thing because as much as I love knowing what what a writer intended and I think it, it can inform my opinions and stuff um, 
I also feel like if something is really emotionally resonant with me in a particular story and then I find out maybe the writer, they meant something completely different or they didn't actually put as much thought in it, into it as I have, it doesn't really matter because the story still spoke to me in that particular way. Um, and it's so, so yeah, like Russell T. Davies, there, there will be things in Children of Earth that, and certainly maybe comes to things to the Doctor line and stuff that, that he probably didn't think about as much as I did in any capacity you know there will be things that that all of us have thought about that he probably didn't think about and this applies to absolutely everything but I think it is it speaks to the sort of complexity and the sheer sort of genius (laughs) not to pick up too much that that we can all look at this and see so much depth and meaning and maybe it wasn't conscious but it doesn't matter because we still got that sort of interpretation from it. It doesn't really matter that Russell didn't didn't intend it because it's there for us. So you know, but but, I, but yeah, it is fascinating to know that that is how he works. As as, as much as I appreciate those kind of post structuralist lookings at it and stuff, I think especially with a visual medium, the thing is. The scripts are the first stage. And so, what Davies is thinking or not thinking as he does the scripts are all one thing. But eventually, the five scripts are done and then everyone can see all the scripts. And this is before we can see it. Then they can make the connections themselves and, you know, come to their own readings. And, you know, they have tone meetings and stuff to try and unify these readings. And then when it's like the one man directing all these episodes, uh, which was really quite a feat, you know, it's like a five hour movie, how he handled it. And he wasn't, it wasn't synchronous and it wasn't uh, linear that were filming. It was all, all at once. It's very much Davies wasn't necessarily unifying it all in his head at first. Although, like he says, when he was writing the last episode, that's when he started everything connecting up. But every, everyone else after that still gets a pass at unifying it and presenting kind of like a... Well, Art Hall is not the wrong... It's, it's the wrong word because it's all these other people besides Davies that were unifying the series into these kind of coherent it's good things. good team effort. Yeah, but it's still very much... Like, someone could totally do a reading on Children of Earth completely unlike any of ours and unlike Davies or Linz or anyone... But I still, I think much more than with books, with TV shows and movies, they're so collaborative that I think a reading gets strengthened because all these other people get to make their own readings of the scripts. And then often they have tone meetings where they all make sure they're on the same page about, you know, the main thrust of these scripts. And then they make the actors perform the scripts and the composer do the music, you know, for these scripts and everyone do that generally on the same kind of bent which I really like. Oh, yeah. Like, well, that's, that's one of sort of primary sort of criticism for the death of the author thing, because when you're dealing with things that are not just uh, made by one singular person, when you're dealing with things that are like creative teams, then it, the, as a concept, it does start to fall apart. I think it can still apply in situations where, for whatever reason, you come up with an interpretation that, that you can't find any sort of, sort of, intention behind it you can sort of but you but you really it really resonates with you like you can apply it then but i think certainly in terms of tv shows and stuff there's there's a limit to to sort of how how much you can disregard and have your own interpretation you can still do it there's nothing saying you can't go ahead like if you want to interpret children of earth as being pro-government then you (laughs) i mean a bit questionable but go right ahead if you want to um nothing's really stopping you but but certainly when it comes to anything that has so many people working on it, there will be a sort of vision that they are heading towards. I don't think Baths as much with Death of the Author and certainly Foucault in what he called the author function. I don't think it's so much that authors, that RTDs or anyone else's, that their intentions are irrelevant. It's that they're just, they're not singularly ordained or anything. Like yeah, yeah. interfacing with the text is, a TV shows aren't, puzzles where you're trying to work out exactly what the author what any one author was thinking specifically about everything in it when you interface with a text when you watch something you're bringing yourself to it the interaction of you and all your experiences and opinions and your taste interacting with the actual text itself as it's been made by all the many people behind it that's where the sausage is made that's where the meaning is made and then whether the dominant reading of the text whether what most people are getting from it is broadly the same as what the creators were intending. That's all its own kettle of fish. Yeah. But with someone like RTD, who a lot of people, especially Doctor Who, or just Brit- Doctor Who fans or just British TV fans in general, they will know him decently well. That knowledge of RTD and that kind of understanding of the author there becomes a kind of paratext, something not in the actual stories themselves, but 
you know, clearly from what us four are all saying here, it's something that really affects how we perceive the stories. And that's the author function, which is, I think, more nuanced than just the death of the author. I think we should be obliged to clarify that when we talk about death of the author, we're not referring to anyone currently living in Cardiff. (laughs) (laughs) Not before Capaldi completely confirms chaos in Cardiff. (laughs) (laughs) On the subject of um, symbolism and things being connected, something that struck me on a rewatch is that um, Jack having that bomb implanted inside him in the first episode... And obviously the way that's overlapped with Gwen's pregnancy, that seems to be seeding the idea that the child theme in a very fascinating way, isn't it? It's like Jack's pregnant with the bomb, isn't he? Isn't that, that's, that kind of stood out like, hmm, it's kind of this, because obviously some of the interpretations of this series revolve around this idea of like reproduction and Jack's relationship to it as a guy who is immortal and who by the end of the five episodes is totally detached from humanity, from being in a couple, from having a family, from any of that. And so to, to kick off with this image of him having basically this, you know, an, explo- an explosive device put inside his stomach. Uh, almost like a bit like a certain video game by one of our news' favorite developers but let's not go there <laughs> um that that seems that seems to stick out to me did anyone find, else find that interesting bit of symbolism yeah yeah for sure um yeah they were both and it's it's the very same mechanism by which we see gwen is pregnant that we see jack is pregnant with the bomb yeah absolutely um intended and interesting there i saw i saw a take once that was very critical of it seeing it as um was it misogynist or homophobic? It was something. There was something very dearly wrong they saw with Jack's pregnancy. It might have been antinatalist that they saw it as. There is this sort of idea with the Jack thing, and you know, con- contrasting it against Gwen and who's Gwen, who's pregnant with a baby, and Jack is pregnant with a bomb and all this stuff. Um, there's probably something to be said there about how it's like contrasting that idea of you can he- either have one or the other applying sort of queer theory to it and, and those sorts of readings um, and also particular things like Oscar Wilde's the whole, you can have a future in the form of art or you can have a future in the form of family. The topic I think you're talking about is reproductive futurism <gasps> and yes, things that's, like that's yeah, Sorry, I'm so y- Yanto and Jack's <laughs> speech when you know they're talking about humanity Humanity is this great connection to their children and the children are this great potential and humanity will do anything to protect its children. It's this big appeal to reproductive futurism. But of course, that, you know, it doesn't work. That leads to the failed ending of, of episode four. Yeah. Yanto dies and it's ver- it's to turn it back to queer theory and stuff, it's very fascinating to read it in light of, you know, Yanto and Jack are a homosexual relationship. The sort of society's ideal is being in a... In a- a hitch norm of relationship, you yeah. know, having children and everything. But in a sense, in a way, and, and, and it's like gay people are expected to conform to that and get married and, and adopt or whatever. The idea that Jack is essentially, he can't have that sort of, that sort of heteronormative ideal. He can't have it because regardless of anything, he, um, he will always outlive his partners and he can't really be with his children, see them grow up and contribute to the future in the same way that maybe the sort of idealised nuclear family sort of could. So, um, there, and then also he's with Yanto and everything and, and the whole idea it's just fascinating from the perspective they're talking about children and stuff. But then, anyway, this is like getting into sort of all oh, deep discussion. But I think in terms of that one scene, just like having Jack be pregnant with a bomb is just fascinating from that lens. Like, I, I think that's, yeah. There's another really subtle thing in the finale that I think we can see is kind of this rebuke to re- reproductive futurism. And that's when Jack uh, fucking kills his own grandson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's literally, he's killing his own legacy you know so it's yeah. it's like again it's like the idea that jack rejects this idea it like has his sort of core of his character as, as rejecting that idea i think yeah and and in the series in general series three that is i think it really probes this idea of reproductive futurism and children as the future uh, you know how is it said in the simpsons uh, won't somebody please think of the children and it, it's such a insincere thing governments use it's it's totemic it's not like a genuine ideology it ties back to the idea of also the children being sort of object of their agency in the story because you know they're they're almost an idea rather than a reality which is probably why the government finds it so easy to to uh, send that amount like all those children to their deaths because they're only thinking about their own immediate family as people in a sense 
Um, I think that whole idea is expressed really beautifully in like the very first scene of day one when um, Frobisher and Yanto's sister are both going about their daily routines and they neither of them notice that the kids are actually possessed by the 456 because they're too busy. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that kind of ties into yeah, the theme of the yeah. kids as like a political tool. And a lesser writer might use that scenario as an opportunity to make a jab about how like kids are engrossed in their devices or the Wi-Fi or something. But Russell T. Davies, I think, uses it to... And he doesn't dwell on it either. It's just a very, like, you almost, you, the viewer, almost don't notice that something's wrong with the children at first. We want a pony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, just the way that, like, fa- having a family is talked about, like, having an affliction, like, through these five episodes, you know, in very hushed tones. It's very, you know, yeah, like you said, a condemnation of the reproductive futurism. Yeah, and also, like, the, the characters who don't have a family, like, they feel like they've won almost because they're like, I don't have any children, so I don't have any horses in the show. Yeah, like Decker. You know? Yeah. Decker. So they're like, they're <laughs> almost. <laughs> no, not that, not that Decker. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. He doesn't capitulate with terrorism. <laughs> um, there's something we haven't mentioned in light of this whole reproduction conversation, which is that Gwen, we find out in the first episode that Gwen is pregnant, and in the final episode, there's that brief exchange between her and Reese. She kind of, she sort of almost like Reese is like well you're not getting rid of it and Gwen sort of nails him with that sort of look like oh is that right and then later on she she apologizes she's like of course I wouldn't get rid of it I'd never do that to you and in the end you'll be she, you know she's heavily pregnant six months later so and she have Reese she and Reese have completely embraced this idea of like they want to have a kid and the question that Gwen raises earlier of would you want to have a kid in this world like their answer to that ends up being yes so that's kind of the, the other the other response to that uh, that reproduction question because they, they sort of th- this idea of just having kids just because you want a future and you want you want that sort of you want that child to come into the world and to love and so, so I think while certainly Jack rejects any concept of that by obviously killing off his own bloodline and separating himself totally from humanity on the other side you have Gwen who decidedly doesn't yeah it's like a balanced approach almost can these two characters i'm just one little thing um you briefly mentioned that the whole concept of it kind of privileges people who can sort of uh, birth children naturally and such and i think the the reason for that is more that um with queer relationships having had that history of being sort of at the margins and kind of pushed out i think those ideas and those subcultures among kind of gay men and among queer people they kind of form up in reaction against the dominant culture and the dominant culture when it comes to yeah when it comes to heterosexual relationships and and reproduction is this idea of families and children so the stuff that's reacting against that is frequently going to have kind of an ambivalence to the idea of you know children and obviously and obviously that's not something that's necessarily permanent or like ideal or all encompassing or perfect, but it's just something that's going to be kind of common because obviously, you know, queer couples can adopt and so on and so forth. But like at the same time, that's sort of, that's something that's kind of a proactive step to take. It's not necessarily like the, it's not the societally assumed default at the moment. Yeah, it's like a subversion or rejection of it, and it's just the same way the the concept of heteronormativity is a thing where people assume the sort of uh, straight until proven otherwise uh, concept. Um, it all ties back into sort of what society expects and what society views as the default. So, not adhering to that default is inherently subversive, inherently sort of. Um, disruptive almost um but that's not a bad thing in any capacity at all uh, but it but yeah i get what you mean i know there are more series of tortured after this but this is totally a show finale you know the ending originally rtd was going to have torchwood status terminated as the end screen of this but then he thought oh this is going to seem way too much like a finale and he was thinking of um doing a fourth season in america by then but it totally ends the narrative by jack's alien nature him finally you know, completely absconding from human morality, killing his grandson and then fucking off because he's like, this world's too small. I'm too alien. I've got to bail. Like, you know, this this friction is too much for me to bear and it's too much for my family to bear. And I know you, Gwen, accept me, but, you know, everyone else is dead, you know, pretty much. And now you've got your own family. It's time for me to go to America. <laughs> so, you know how um, at the end he says... Uh, Gwen asked him if he's going to come back, you know, when he's leaving. Yeah. One day, um, I will come back. <laughs> um, okay, I thought this is quite 
fascinating. Uh, so basically, he says, she goes, uh, are you going to come back? And he says, what for? Now, again, this is like something that, that I don't know how intentional it was, but there's a nice sort of call back there so three times in the series he he gets sort of presented with sort of or like he says something like i'll come back so one of them one of them is when he comes back uh in series two after leaving with the doctor yeah yeah um, yeah yeah so he says he says i came back for you right and he says it's a yanto first but then he sort of he goes i came back for all of you um then Shit, I forgot what episode it's in now. Um, still on Earth. Still on Earth, and he says, I'll come back. Or maybe it's only two times in. Anyway, he says, I'll come back, I always do. Um, and so, and then, so contrast though, is saying, I came back for you, I came back for all of you, or whatever, and then I'll come back, I'll always do. And then contrast that with the end of Children of Earth, when Gwen goes, will you come back? And he says, what for? Um, so that's... But I don't know that I feel like that's also important for specifically lost Yanto because yeah. we have that sort of I came back for you and then he corrects himself and he says I came back for all of you and refers to the team as a whole but he has that you know that sort of specifically saying it to Yanto so so I think it is especially sad that it's framed as a sort of like he's lost you know, in addition to sort of air quotes losing Gwen because she's moving on to a sort of domestic life and stuff, but it's the fact that he's lost Yanto. So, so contrasting that line of going like that, you know, what for? Because essentially the thing he did come back for, or like, you know, supposedly obviously he did come back for Gwen as well, but the thing he came back for before is gone. So, you know, what's keeping him on Earth anymore? So he can't promise that he'll come back because... Yanto's gone. Yeah, essentially. Y- y- Yanto is like his last tie to, you know, not just humanity, but like human relationships. And you're actually try- to trying yeah. to be with anyone, like, at all in any sort of romantic, sort of loving capacity. And I think um, that it-, it reminds me of what Yanto's last lines were to Jack, which is sort of like pleading him, like, you know, in, in a thousand years, you're going to forget about me. Like, please don't forget me. And that's like the last, that's the last thing they say to each other. And Jack's like, I'll never forget you. But, and, and, and I think having that be sort of highlighted in that scene, in that death scene, it's, it's kind of stressing that point that Jack's immortality is kind of what makes, it's kind of saying, well, you know, fuck it, damn, you know, Jack can't do this. Like, this is how his relationships are going to end. And that leads to him just utterly abandoning the concept in the, the next episode. And there's another, there's a BBC radio drama. It's the deadline. Okay, it's the deadline. There's a point in that, there's a point where Jack is essentially in a coma. And Yanto has a big long speech to him. Oh, um, yeah. And he's, yeah. I yeah. remember it. Yep. So, yes. So, uh, close your ears right now if you want to go and listen to this. I'm just going to briefly explain because I'm not going to go into specifics. I've watched you in your sleep. Did you know that? So many times. Just woken up beside you in the middle of the night and watched you. But let's be honest, Jack. I'm nothing more than a blip in time for you. How could you watch me grow old and die? How can I watch you live and never age a day? I suppose we both know that will never be a problem. Not in this job. No one in Torch would ever live to draw their pension, do they? Even if by some miracle I survive to see my hair turn grey, I don't kid myself that you'd still be around to see it. One day, you'll go again, just like you did before. And this time you won't be back. Maybe that's what you're dreaming about those nights when I watch you sleeping. But he, he he talks about how he wakes up sometimes at night and he watches Jack sleeping and he thinks about. What are you laughing at? That's a derisive laugh. What? It's very it's very romantic. Oh it's very romantic. <laughs> I'm gonna, oh my god. Anyway, sharp. It's cute. Okay, fuck off. Um, so he watches Jack sleeping and he thinks about what you might be dreaming about. Stop. It just it, was, Stop it, it reminded me of Twilight. Do you remember when Edward? Corals into <laughs> Bella's room like at midnight and just watches her sleep. <laughs> it's, I just remember that. Remind me of random shoes. Oh, random shoes. Yeah, that's even more relevant. Yeah, it's a subversion of Twilight though. It's the um, instead of the immortal watching the mortal sleep, it's the mortal watching the immortal. Anyway, yeah. Smart. <laughs> wow, it's all connected. Tortured cinematic universe. Anyway, um, he, he watches Jack sleeping, watches him dreaming, and wonders if Jack will ever remember him he's he's fixated on this idea that jack will eventually forget him that that 
you know, he'll grow old and die, and sadly he doesn't. And stuff. He has this line where he says, I'm nothing more than a blip in time to you. Um, and so this is like this big long speech, Jack's still unconscious. And at the very, very, very end of the audio drama, um, Jack basically reveals that he heard the entire speech when he was unconscious. Um, uh, and he says that you, it's, <laughs> you it's, never... <laughs> Did you talk to me while I was out of it? They say that's what you should do. I talked a little, but I'm not really much of a talker. I know. Well, that's just me. Yeah. But you never will just be a blip in time, Yanto Jones. Not for me. And I think that is sort of true and <laughs> cute, and people like to also make. Uh, what? It, it's, Neil, well, you know, what it, have you got to say? It reminds me of. Do you know that it's meme of, of that woman that's like saying, "Oh, oh babe, they caught me slipping." And it's like sh- she wasn't oh, really asleep. No, sh- she was just pretending to oh be asleep my. to take the photo. Just Jack was Shut doing up, a move like Shut that. Up. You're ruining a beautiful scene. I'm gonna kill you for this. Okay, okay. People also like to make the connection between. Um, do you know Gridlock? You know that episode? Um, Russell T. Davies were. It's almost like it's a good episode or something. Anyway, uh, so almost. that's almost <laughs> big crabs. Anyway. The face of Bo dies in it. Um, people like to make this connection. Again, this is something that God only knows what was the thinking. Because this came out before Children of Earth, right? I got my times right. Very I did. much, yes. very much so. Very much so. Uh, I just think it's interesting that there is a part of a face of Bo, aka Jack, if you subscribe to that idea, which you should because it's hilarious and great. Um, he protects the cat nurse from a virus, an alien virus that wipes out the city. I oh, yeah. don't know what my point is and here. Yanto was always a <laughs> bit catty, so. so I can see the parallelism there. <sighs> I, w- I, would, I would leave this podcast right now <laughs> if I could. Just for that. that. That's, that's, it's that RTD retroactive foreshadowing we were talking about over a two year span. Yeah, like, I, I don't know if, like, the, like, if he, like, again, it's like maybe not conscious, maybe not even, maybe there isn't even a connection there, but I just think it's fascinating that, that one of his absolute final acts was saving someone from an alien virus in a way that he couldn't save Yanto. I just had a bit of a culture shock <laughs> moment being reminded that there's only two years between the transmission of Children of Earth and Tinkerbell Jesus Tenant in <laughs> series three. <Yeah. laughs> how, like, that's quite an arc, man, isn't it? How can one man go so right, you know? I think it's because going like, from every Jesus sh- to Children of Earth. Every showrunner of Doctor Who inevitably reaches the point where they just resent the show. So, like Russell T Davies in two thousand and nine, yeah. he created this Children of Earth where, like, like you said, Code, if Captain Jack confronted the Doctor about not being in this, the show would be broken beyond repair. Like RTD just created this yes. hot potato of ethics, which he just fobbed off onto Moffat, which you know I love him for, and <laughs> <laughs> I have. It's great. I have great. turned around on the end of time as well since you know my naive young days of hating it, and yeah, no, two thousand very nicely done. <laughs> two thousand and nine RTD, I, I stand. I, I I do think it's it's great, like that, that idea that you would have a fundamentally broken show if you ever sort of if you ever sort of brought Torchwood and Doctor Who together and sort of consciously acknowledged the differences, like by having a meeting of Jack and the Doctor post Children of Earth. We don't actually get that aside from the face of both thing, but also the face of both so far in the future. Like, let's just put it off the table right now. Um, the closest you get is obviously in the end of time where Jack sees um, the Doctor in a bar. Hey, by the way, Jack drinking in a bar? What does that signify? Hmm, I wonder. Anyway. <laughs> I can I can read out verbatim the paragraph where RTD came up with this exchange, by the way. In, in fact, I'm going to do Please it. Please do, <clears throat> because I'm really curious. I, I can't do the RTD voice, I'm afraid, so this is going to be my That's voice. That's a shame. But uh, welcome back. Australian He's- RTD. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, the welcome back isn't important. Okay. I, Russell Hi. T. Davies, <laughs> thought of the mid. Sh- <laughs> Sorry. I, <laughs> I, Hi, Russell T. Davies. Hi, Russell. <laughs> Guest star. <laughs> I thought of the midshipman frame bit on the spot, literally as I typed it. The doctor was going to acknowledge Jack 
and then Jack turns around and snogs a Slovene, <laughs> which would still be very funny. But poor Jack is so alone at the end of Torchwood Series 3 and deserves something happy. Plus, the episode special needed a laugh. Nothing better than making the Doctor a gay pimp to get a laugh in my book. It was a proper moment of creativity, of real invention. The words midshipman frame typed themselves out in front of me. Or maybe I just think about Russell Tovey all the time. God, I can't believe we had the budget to get Russell T. Davies on this podcast. Shocking. <laughs> Our reach is far. Anyway, <laughs> see, it's funny that he, he frames it in that way, so he wanted to make it like a humorous scene. And I guess it works like the end of time. The end of time, you don't have space, given that he's doing his big tour of all his companions. You don't have space or time or even um, any, any inclination to have any sort of meaningful interaction between Jack and the Doctor. Um, that scene is interesting because uh, obviously it's framed as of Jack post Children of Earth, sad, drinking in a bar. You know what alcohol means for Jack. Um, but I always find it fascinating that obviously, it makes sense of course, when you watch the scene back, uh, which I encourage you to do so that you know I'm not just talking bullshit, uh, Jack doesn't necessarily look happy to see the Doctor. He just sort of stares at him, doesn't smile, doesn't, you know, crack a smile or anything. He just sort of stares at him. The only time he smiles in the scene is when he puts on the charm for Alonzo, which is, uh, you know, we know how Jack is putting on a front and not being his true authentic self sometimes. Um, so it's quite, I think it's quite meaningful that the, the look he shares with the Doctor is grim. I feel like, for my own personal interpretation of things post Children of Earth, because I feel like Jack would justifiably be angry at the Doctor, it does almost ruin it in a sense. But then also it doesn't. I, I don't know how I feel about it. The, the whole sort of salute to the Doctor. But then, I've, but then that's not an inherently positive thing necessarily. After seeing the, the sort of depth that Torchwood takes Jack to, I almost struggle to to not not, not really struggling to, to enjoy, but I just feel like. The sort of Doctor Who version of him, as much as I really love it, it, it sort of feels like there is... It feels emptier to me, but then it's also easy to sort of interpret as um, the Jack in Doctor Who is obviously, in a sense, hiding his real self because he's interacting with the Doctor and that seems like something he would very much do, given that he does hide the, his real self from people and certainly he would hide it from someone who he, at least at that point in time, he idolises. Day two was the episode that felt the most sort of classic Torchwoody to me. Like it's got all those weird yeah, hijinks, yes. like like going like recent and Gwen climbing on the potatoes and just shit like that, and sort of breaking Jack <laughs> out of that concrete box in the news. That's such a cute scene. I love that scene. There's a lot. There was a lot more comedy uh, in day two than I remembered there being. Yeah, like broad comedy too. <laughs> it was the calm before the storm, before all the trauma hits. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a really well constructed. Not, not that it was episode. without trauma. I just I just find it really funny that it was like. Yanto put on his little hard hat and his little high vest jacket. Yeah, that was indeed. Yeah, like that was just great. Love it. Looking at the episodes, um, as you know, five distinct episodes. It's interesting because remember this was kind of cracked in a writer's room. Like the treatments for all the episodes were done, but like we were talking about before, huge aspects of the finale weren't cracked in the writer's room. They came to RTD later. It's more like the first four episodes were cracked in the writer's room. Is is fair to say? Is my understanding. But anyway. I think it's interesting because all of them except day three do feel like individual episodes to me. You know, day one sets out the new aesthetic and direction for the show. It sets up the fairy tale vibe from the start with that excellent Ben Foster music. No Murray Gold this series. It's all Ben Foster. Who does the uh, big finish torture music as well? Excellent stuff. It sets out, you know, that beautiful cue that's very fairy tale and then it gets all dark and then it brings the fairy tale bit back again as we're seeing the 1965 scene of the children getting taken away. And then we get that new, I call it the politics theme, that theme we get when important things are happening that goes like... Dun, 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 dun. So, day one is going to got that purpose, blowing up the hub at the end, it's setting up the new version of the show. Day two is the most episodic, I think, in that it's about Jack's not in the narrative. He's been taken out of it because he's getting concreted. How is everyone going to deal with this? And it's got, you know, the broader comedy, like you were saying. Day four is the false ending. 
you know, where we get the big Doctor Who speeches and attempts and it all fails spectacularly and spectacularly and Yanto dies. Uh, <laughs> day five is, you know, the finale and it's all about bringing everything to a close. It's framed around Gwen's uh, speech to the camera. But day three is just kind of like... Um, it's, Day you know, three, get <laughs> fucked. It's not it's even just, worth talking about. It's just a tissue in between. It's just it's it's mostly table setting at the second hub where the series like needs to revert. Oh, we need a location for characters to talk. We need to you know set up the chessboard for the next two episodes a bit. I still like it, but it's very much the one episode in the series that feels to me like it's just connecting things and doesn't really have much of an identity of its own. Is Day Three the hijinks where they steal people's credit cards? Oh, yeah. yeah, that was fantastic. I, I like that bit. I love it. It's so good. And I love how it's all just like the key to stealing things is have more than one person with you so you can cause a distraction. It's really not that hard. Oh my God. Torture just creating criminals. To be fair, day three does have <laughs> the first conversation between Frobish and the 456, doesn't it? The bit where they finally manifest yes. and have that whole that whole bit and Frobish is like, you know, can you hear me? You know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Like there, there's big, it's the plotty episode, basically. Setting everything up so that you can all come down, um, fall down. So I'm, I'm interested to know what all of you consider would be the best episode. My ranking is five, four, one, two, three. Interesting. For me, it's probably day four. I um I don't tend to rank things because no, so I I you know I know there are separate episodes. Children of Earth is like one big story to me, so I kind of don't. I prefer not to divide it up too much. Even though I can, and I would, but I don't. There you go. I don't rank it. The only reason I would choose day four is for the scene in the conference government room where they're negotiating, like, which children. I think that's oh, yeah. by far the best scene in the whole serial. I, I agree about that. Well, when it comes to best episodes, um, I sort of, I don't, I don't want to, like, kill the whole um, episode four big scene discussion there. I, I sort of, um, the, 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 I think something, there's an interesting thing there. RTD seems to like having the penultimate episode have the really big, crucial, political, savagery, condemnation scene in there. Because the same thing applies in um, the penultimate episode of his recent show, Years and Years. There's a bit of a similar scene. I won't go into that because we had a whole podcast on it before. But um, that, scene, that scene is great. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if my favourite episode is four or five because I think both of those are like like superb and like stupendous in their own ways. Episode 4 has that horrible bit where you see the fate of the children that get taken, but then episode 5 has all the wonderful kind of descent into authoritarianism fighting the 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 the, the, the military stuff. Like they're both they're both so good. I could I can pick a favorite. On on that topic of RTD's show from 2019 Years and Years, which was like a um like a political sci-fi-ish kind of drama set in the future, very close future, like next 15 years. We talked about this on the podcast for that series, but it's very germane here, so I'm going to reprise talking about it. In the writer's tale, when RTD is talking about, as we mentioned earlier, his difficulties cracking the finale for Children Earth, he's saying, we were running out of time, it's all my fault, I should have written stuff earlier, I can't crack the ending. Uh, even when we were cracking the series, we just looked at episode five as emptiness. We had no solution to it. So I took a deep breath and, well, I, meaning Russell T Davies, gave away one of the best ideas I've ever had. It wasn't a Torchwood idea. It was a notion I've had in my head for 20 years and a series I've always been dying to write. It's something I've talked at length with all manner of producers that we could make together one day. And he did eventually make it. This is the 2019 series, years and years. He's talking about... And it was, in his words, a family drama in which the world goes to hell, ending with our nice, safe, comfy Western society descending into anarchy or a military state, like those nightmare regimes we hear about on the news or in history, but right here on our doorsteps with ordinary people like you and me and our mums and our dads and our brothers and our sisters, not just watching it, but part of it. Brilliant idea, he said of his own idea. And now I find myself using it up on Torchwood. I love Torchwood, but this was a good six hours of drama, as it eventually became in 2019. Maybe 12 hours, as it never became. Maybe three years of drama, as it definitely never became. That I've been planning for decades, condensed onto the ending of a sci-fi spin-off thriller. That is true. I think the parallel there is truly fascinating and perhaps does not uh, necessarily flatter both shows. Uh, I don't want to get... Um, 
too far into this, but I think the, the, the way in which the two shows tackle that same core idea of society descending into, you know, authoritarian hellscape, um, it seems to be tackled very stridently in Children of Earth in a way which it perhaps was not 10 years later. I don't know what if you, I mean, Neo and Tate, you guys have watched it. I don't know if you'd agree there. Well, the strongest parallel for me is in um, The Resolution, which is Children of Earth. Lois records the entire exchange in the conference room, and that's sort of how the government is, you know, air quotes, brought down at the end of Children of Earth. The thing with Children of Earth is I very much call it the good... Uh, well, that's a really harsh way of putting it. I call it the best RTD finale. I think it's the finale of RTDs that completely sticks the landing, and it has a follow-through, which none of his other finales, not just years and years, but very frequently Doctor Who and other shows as well, have in that he tends to... And I don't think this is because of his, you know, not planning much seat of his pants writing style. I think it's more his ideologies are sometimes at odds with the audiences he wants to capture or the ways he wants to capture them. Like, he's very much about hope in Doctor Who. But like he says himself, his ultimate idea of love is unrequited love. But he has the Doctor and Rose end up in like this weird clone Kendall happy relationship off in another universe. It's like he's always kind of second guessing or undercutting himself and not to spoil years and years but you know there are certainly elements of that in the construction of that show and its finale but children of earth there's no point where he slinks away from being as pe pessimistic and cynical as i feel like he really wants to write or writes naturally although originally he didn't kill stephen off in the first draft and julie gardner basically told him you obviously want to kill stephen off write the actual story russell go back and fix it and so he did but yeah, Children of Earth, I think, is his strongest finale of anything because... But yes, my point is just that I feel like the Children of Earth finale is RTD's best finale because everything ties... Of best of his shows I've seen, anyway. Because it has the follow-through and everything. He never bottoms out. It's cynical all the way through, which is how I feel RTD best operates in. Also seen in Doctor Who Midnight and other episodes like that. Also, the recording thing doesn't work in Children of Earth, does it? Yeah, and the PM gets... Obviously, the PM's disgraced, but that horrible woman takes over instead. Like, none of it... Like, none of that stuff really works in terms of actually fixing the system. Something I really liked with the start of episode two was how the diegetic score weaves in and out, uh, depending on whether we're in Gwen's point of view shots or not. I don't know if you guys can remember what I'm oh, talking yeah, about, good. but it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, she's, she's yeah. kind of like partially deafened by the explosion, it sort of cuts in and out with the music. It's really, really cool, I yeah. like that. Um, Mr. Neil, sir, can I say something? Yeah. Um, uh, so, <laughs> unit fucking sucks. Okay, that's all I had to say. No, actually, uh, more to say on that, I noticed that when we were talking about series two, we didn't really talk about fragments, so I'm just going to quickly drop this in here. <laughs> that's um, a reason for that. <laughs> Uh, you know, know fucking sucks yeah. is my point um the way Tosh is treated oh my god and then unit dickheads and children of earth as well beat it yeah Tosh's story in fragments i think is great it's really interesting it's back to this whole so like day five at the start does you know inverting doctor who and looking at doctor who in a different light unit are fucked up very yeah totalitarianist uh totalitarian yes. uh totalitarian uh, yes <laughs> How they, how unit was, you know, it, they put on the red caps and the nice faces for the doctor and stuff is my reading of things. But they're corrupt. Or they're totalitarianist as fuck to Tosh. Yeah, really liked that in Fragments, how messed up they were. Because yeah. look, that, that kind of government... <laughs> that, that kind of gov yeah. That, yeah, I really like that one. <laughs> that, <laughs> Sorry, continue. That kind of yeah. government... <laughs> Uh, agency, you know, it's a very, it's like a very Guantanamo Bay esque. I thought it was yes. really well done, and it carried over into Children of Earth quite well. And again, that theme of passing the buck, they passed the fuck out of the buck in Children of Earth. They were constantly doing that. Tor Torchwood has yeah. its own inherent badness, although this is much more. This is what James Goss, who's like the showrunner for the audio, so he's very interested in this, and he probes this really interestingly. But. Torchwood aren't, you know, they're much more bad when you think about them, whereas Unit are just bad. You know, their, their yeah, actions are bad, yeah. they're on the surface bad. Torchwood is like, you muse over it and you go, oh, wow, I really don't like the implications here. That's actually quite imperialist and monarchist as fuck. But Unit are just, oh, let's imprison people, let's do a Guantanamo Bay, you know, let's be rude to Jack, equally bad. Yeah. I dare thee. I wouldn't stand for it being rude to Jack. It's too much for me. Also, Torchwood 3 seems to operate more on, um... Uh, 
almost like well, because Jack is essentially Doctor Mirror slash Parallel, he is like um, Doctor Three operates almost like a Doctor and his companions. Whereas yeah. um, whereas Torchwood as an organization is is like more comparable to Unit. Not to say there's not maybe there's not issues with Torchwood Three for various reasons. Capaldi in this, he feels like physically smaller than he usually does. Um, speaking of Capaldi, could I just like take a moment to shill his acting in this series? Oh, he's so good. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he's amazing. Yes, yes. Which is so interesting because he's obviously playing against type of Malcolm Tucker, who's like obviously the character most what they're thinking of. But well, it's not they're basing the character on this. They're basing the character off, like off, off. You know what I mean? Not off this. Off, off, off. this. Yeah, against oh, this. Yes. Because Malcolm Tucker, he, he's like, it's, you know when Gandalf um, goes Bilbo Buggins and he like looms over Bilbo and like the whole room bends around him and it makes him look huge? Malcolm Tucker does that like naturally. He walks he controls in a room. the room. Yeah, he yeah. controls the room. Exactly. That's a non nerdy way to say it. Whereas Frobisher, you know, even with Bridget Spears, who's like, he supports him a trillion percent, he still kind of slinks around her, you know, hands of the page, you know, looks around and runs away. Like, he's such a shy, small, little, a perfect little banal, evil, bu- b- banal bureaucratic figure that typifies bureaucratic evil. It's maybe a better way to put it. Yeah, and he can have so much, like, subdued malice in the way that, like, he shoes Lois Habiba out of the room in episode one. He just says, like, thank <laughs> yeah. you. And he just yeah. it out. It's amazing. And he's, nice like, weather. The, way, I- the way he trembles throughout the whole series, it's just, like, amazing. I absolutely adore his final scene and I love the framing of it it's so good when you've got uh, Bridget you know speaking like you know just remember like no matter what happens or whatever uh, John Frobisher was a good man and then contrasting that with him shooting his family like it's, yeah. oh my god and it's especially tragic when you've obviously seen the whole series and you know that it was for nothing because the four, five, six didn't actually end up taking the children in the yeah. end. So, so it, oh, it's just so good. That scene interests me because it's so RT. Like the thing of overlaying the speech and intercutting between the speech and him shooting his family is very RTD. Like that's a total RTD move there. But the move to obscure that Bridget Spears got the contact lenses off Lois Abiba and, you know, plotted with her. It's, that's such a Moff-esque thing to do. Yeah. Like, it's, you know, to hide the little timeline of something so it could come back later as a cool little chronology twist on that. I really was struck how Moff-esque that was um, watching the episode. So, it's yeah. a cool little union of styles, like Captain Jack yeah. himself. Yeah. Ties everything together um, as well, which was really lovely. But yeah, such a such a powerful scene. I found that monologue about how Frobisher was a good man. I find that very fascinating because it seems to it, there seems to be a real kind of core of anger in there because like you can't look at you know the way the things he's done over the course of the series, the way he's kind of presented as the antagonist, the way he tries to get people killed, and the, the sheer scale of evil that he's complicit in. You can't actually look in that and say, well, he's a good man, and yet we're given this such this sincere speech. And we're kind of, and we're invited to feel so bad for him because you know he's out here, he's killing his family just to spare them from this un- unimaginable fate. It's it's kind of inviting us to question our entire assumptions about someone who just who does their job and who just follows orders. And it's sort of it's sad and also critical at the same time, which is what makes it so interesting and complex. It's a really great scene. Yeah, because there's, n- there's no easy answer there, you know, which which I really like. Cause when it comes to sort of um, situations just like this in general, like when you're talking about morality and when you're when you're sort of relating to someone on a personal level rather than a sort of um, occupational level in a sense, it, it, it's different because also you're seeing the two sides of Frobisher, the side that, that is complicit in this evil and then the side that obviously loves his family um, but it's like it's the whole idea that obviously these two things exist simultaneously and it's the it's the almost irony that he spends, he, he works to sort of send all these children to their deaths and yet he uh, well not their deaths really, I mean they, they well live they just have a horrific life um, sending these children away to be used like that when he is so against it for his own children that he would do something so horrific, like it is, it, it is so fascinating. It sort of, um, it also like furthers this idea that the people at the top view themselves as sort of different to everyone below them. Um, 
And also, honestly, that, that, that scene, every single time, even though I know it's coming, because I've rewatched it, obviously, I flinch every single gunshot. Every time. I don't know what it is. I'd never normally do. It's just so... If I could backpedal back to the um, whole Frobisher yes. kids yes, situation. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, what gets me is that, like, the Prime Minister, he could have offered to give Frobisher's kids at least, like, a merciful death, but he doesn't even want to give, like, dirty his hands to that extent. He, like, has to just let him go to the aliens to be suspended, you know, for all we know in perpetuity. But, like, he's just that evil i suppose but it's also believable uh, yeah i like how the prime minister is always like oh yeah i, I won't have any of this in my hands i won't have any of this even though he's the one giving the orders he is ultimately when it comes down to ultimately responsible because has says executive decisions and stuff that that lead to what happens but he he likes to pretend he's on his high horse and he's he's above it all and that just because he doesn't pull the trigger himself he's not actually the, the one uh responsible well can i say who my second favorite actor in this is Yes, Tet, you can. Um, You're allowed. Eve Miles, I believe, has the best reactions in the business. <gasps> she's yes, so great. She's great. Yeah, because I, I think, love her. Like, you know, I'm not an actor, but I can pretend to be. And, you know, I think most actors. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what, that's what actors do. <laughs> most actors, they like, if they're reacting to something, they emphasize the reaction. But what Eve Miles does is she emphasizes the way she tries to, like, stifle the reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Even as back as everything changes the first episode of the series, when <laughs> Susie pulls out the gun, do you remember Gwen's reaction, Eve Miles' reaction? It's so good. It's like this kind of flappy yes. handed, total fear, trying to stifle the fear thing. It's so real. It's oh, amazing yeah. actress. She's so great, Eve like, Miles. Best actor in the show. Really a big fan. Yeah. Yeah, and um when she f- when she finds out that Clem like knows that she's pregnant and she gives this kind of she's trying to maintain composure but she's completely deer in the headlights and you know, utterly convincing. Do you know I really like in that scene where she's speaking to Clem and she sort of, um, she's trying to comfort him and he's gets hands on the table and she sort of reaches out, but like she sort of hesitates before putting, like, for touching his hand and stuff. I, I can't explain it very well. You know it when you see it. It's like the close up of their hands. Yeah, yeah the hands little know. knock thing. Yeah. I, I just really love that for some reason. Hmm. It's, oh, yeah. it's so good. Clem will remember that. Do you remember the- do you remember the bit where she, she communicates to Reese that she's pregnant without a single word? Yes, it's yeah. so good. That bit's so on good. The potatoes. Honestly, Eve Miles is absolutely amazing, and I will never understand the people who get pissed off at her being sen- like the main character of Torchwood, no, because it's... she's spectacular. Gwen Cooper is such a delight to watch. Easily one of the best Doctor Universe characters. Relatively, She's one of the relatively few actors that transitions on audio and changes the performance to fit audio but makes it as i think equally interesting as what she does on the show as well it's really if you've heard her yeah. audio you know what i mean it's a really she modulates yeah, it yeah. a little differently but it's like equally detailed it's really really impressive how she does John audio Barman does that as well her you know? series five performance you know has to be heard to be believed it's really something i'm excited for it i'm starting it soon i feel like i feel like we're wrapping to an end but like do you guys how would you guys feel if Torchwood had essentially ended here? Because we, we mentioned earlier it feels like a show finale. Happy. And it's it seems almost like the show, like, is that how much more can the show actually say at this point, as it is? Like, you know, what, you know, Jack coming back seems very much up in the air. Like, would he ever even, would he ever even come back at this point? And it's like, the show has just made such a, such a huge statement by bringing together all of its kind of most kind of key elements and deconstructing them all and Bruce Lee, you know, parting ways with Doctor Who utterly. It's like, it would have been a really satisfying ending to the whole show, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, I feel like I really struggled to sort of move on to Series 4 after watching Children of Earth because I was like, how can Series 4 justify its own existence when Series 3 ended so perfectly? Torchwood 3 was dissolved, Jack had left Earth, Gwen and Reese had ostensibly moved on in their life, and, you know, and I was thinking, I was thinking, there's no way that I could, I feel like I could fully enjoy Series 4 because, you know, because this is this that's how what I felt was like th- that was it that was Torchwood you know it, it really doesn't have to go on and I loved how the ending sort of Jack is so doctory in his ending where he runs away you know um, 
He even says, and, I've, li- I've lived many lives, and this is go- I'm going to move on to another one. Like, he literally talks yeah, like he's regenerating. Like, yeah, it's like, it's a metaphorical regeneration, and I love it. And, um, and it's, and also, like, Series 4, also, we will discuss that in its own podcast. There's, there's a line that sort of brings the, the Doctor comparison to the forefront that made me so happy when I heard it. Again, we'll discuss that then. Um, but so, so I was really struggling to move on to Series 4, and I felt like it had to do something really good and sort of, uh, with Jack's characterization and, and Gwen to sort of, um, like, for it to not feel like a complete fucking waste and thankfully it did um but yeah i feel like see if, if series if series three had been the final end i feel like it would have been absolutely perfect in every single way and it wrapped things up neatly i'm not complaining that it continued because i i, I, I did you know i did enjoy series four and yet again we will talk about that later but but series three was just if it had ended there i would have zero complaints like i wouldn't feel like something was missing I have so much defense to give series four and five and, you know, all the other ways the show can, well, all the other ways Torchwood continued after Children of Earth. But at the same time, you know, I will readily admit this was the perfect finale and conclusion of the show. And everything else is a little bit like, like, obviously I count it. And in my head, it's just as real and important, you know, interesting as what came before. And in many ways, I find what came after more interesting than, you know, the first two series. But so it's just the perfect conclusion to Gwen and Yanto's... Not Yanto. Uh, well... Uh, well, it's the conclusion to yeah. Yanto's story in some <laughs> senses. Yeah. Gwen and Jack's characters, it's a perfect conclusion. And oh, is there any way I can explain this without spoiling later? No, there isn't. It's the perfect conclusion, which is interesting. And so in that sense, yeah, this was... I would have been if the show ended here i certainly would have been happy because you know it's a great ending i'm happy we got more but at the same time you always kind of it's like with doctor who i think a lot of people have in their heads oh the show ended here and they still watch the later series and they might even enjoy them but in their head you know the time of the doctor is when the show finished you know f- or the hell bent is where the show finished is i think kind doctor of thing Falls. does that make sense it's kind of like yeah you, ha- you have a personal finale and you still count yeah. what comes after but this was the you go, this series is it, probably not going to have a stopping point because it's a sci-fi it series. Different. But this is the point in my head I consider the best stopping point, even though it didn't actually stop there. Well, is it, do you feel like if it had ended at series three, there hadn't been a televised series four and it moved on to the audios, would you... like? Yeah, this is probably something we can discuss in series four episode. Uh, actually, maybe, maybe just set that aside for now. You know, we'll discuss that later because it would require the context of knowing what happens in series four and maybe. Yeah, we'll you know, cover that. In a, to, it's to, an inter- interesting yeah. question. Tom Tip, what yeah, do you think? What? Yeah, what? Well, how do you think of this as the finale of, of series three's finale as a true finale? Uh, I think it would have been a great finale. It's a bit like has that somber. Um, I guess the Doctor Who equivalent would be the War Games. You know, it sort of just ceases cool, yeah, the yeah. whole premise yeah. of the show. You know, puts a full stop on it in a kind of mean way. Torchwood is just it's just so good and it and it works so well those first three series. I fucking love it. It's basically it. I have a really fun piece of trivia that might make a good ending point or might make a really bad ending point, I'm not sure. It'll be a Tom to ask ending point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um so you know the character Mr. Decker, right? Yeah. He's the the, the, fel- the creepy dude, yeah. The fellow who was into all the four, five, six computer technology and all that sort of thing, creepy all the time. Yeah, that actor made an appearance on Doctor Who very recently. Do you have any idea what that part may have been? I I can't even recall a remnant of what this might have been. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Hey, I'll give you a hint. Does the line um, "A big feast of lives" ring any bells? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I don't remember anything from uh, series eleven. Yeah, that I was from series eleven, wasn't it? It was. That's the like, remnant has been disconnected. It's so oh. many. It's like a rich tapestry of Chibnall reaching through the future and the past of the show. <laughs> She doesn't know. 